Hello there everyone, welcome to today's YouTube video. This is my first piece of original YouTube content. This has not been taken from anything that I have done on Twitch. So today we are gonna go over all of the Shogun 2 factions, both base game and DLC factions. I'll be taking into account four general considerations for each faction. Faction bonuses, the diplomatic situation that the clan starts in, the access to resources, and expansion opportunities. First off, we have the Chosokabe clan. While their bonuses to archers are not exactly great, they have by far the most secure starting position in the game, thanks to both the geography of Shikoku and the political situation around them. They start out on Shikoku, which is completely separated from the other two islands, and they share the island with factions that are either friendly or too weak to pose a threat. While the island is lacking in fertile soil, the neighboring Awa province holds the valuable warhorse resource, which is essential to securing trade with AI factions and for recruiting superior cavalry units. Adding to this is that the Mayashi will typically upgrade the province into a strong recruitment hub, which is just waiting for the Chosokabe to take over it. Beyond this, the clan can choose to expand wherever they want, depending on the emerging political situation and the player's preferences. Adding to all this, the faction gains increased farming income, making them less reliant on inconsistent trade money. Overall, the Chosokabe have such an easy and predictable early game that they can feel quite unsatisfying to play. But their immense flexibility in expansion opportunities later on is still appealing. Next up in the far northeastern corner of Japan is the Date clan. Like the Chosokabe, the Date have rather mediocre faction bonuses. They gain a slight charge bonus to all their units and they can recruit superior Nodachi Samurai, a unit that is quite situational and requires a decent amount of investment in research and buildings before it can be recruited. While they start on the edge of the map, their starting position can still pose a challenge. The provinces in northeastern Japan are large, taking multiple turns to cross through, especially without relevant general skills or road upgrades. This means the Date, more than any other faction, need to carefully time their conquests so as to not be caught in enemy territory in winter. The diplomatic situation can provide a stiff challenge. While the Mogami can be defeated rather easily, the neighboring Hatakeyama possess provinces across Japan, and attacking them will place the Date under threat of a naval counter-invasion. Furthermore, the large provinces often force the Date to fight against larger, more powerful factions, usually the Takeda or Hojo. Thus, their survival hinges on their ability to quickly expand to Fukushima and utilize it as a choke point against stronger enemies. On the flip side, this section of the map is rife with fertile farmland, and the Date's home of Awate province boasts a blacksmith. Unlike most factions who can recruit Yari Samurai, they have immediate access to Katana Samurai, which combined with the smithing specialty gives them a strong core for their early game armies. Unfortunately, Awate will become an impractical recruitment hub as the Date expand westwards. They also do not have easy access to the Warhorse specialty, making it much harder for them to secure trade agreements, while also preventing them from fielding most cavalry units unless they can import the resource from another clan. If the Date are successful in the early game, their situation improves drastically as they move westwards, since they will be fighting along one front. The island of Sado is also a great expansion opportunity as it has a gold mine, is isolated from the rest of Japan, and conquering it will secure the Date's flanks from naval invasions launched by the Hanma clan. Following the Date, we have the Hattori clan, whose main faction bonus has a significant impact on the battlefield. All their infantry units have Kisho training, meaning they can be placed anywhere on the battlefield during the deployment phase, barring, of course, the enemy's deployment area. In addition, these units have improved stealth over their regular counterparts. This immense flexibility comes at a cost. Hattori variants of units are more expensive to train and maintain, and when combined with their central starting position, leaving them prone to being embroiled in multi-front wars, as well as their limited early trade opportunities due to being landlocked, this disadvantage can leave them in a dire situation for much of the early game. Securing central Japan is difficult not only due to the amount of approaches that need to be covered, 
but also because the nearby Ikoiki provinces are difficult to conquer and hold. As the religious unrest will likely tie down Hattori units that are needed elsewhere. To combat their economic strain caused by their own units, the Hattori can recruit a rank 2 ninja from turn 1, a significant advantage when almost no one else has access to agents at all, and the nearby provinces of Omi and Ki have ninja specialties the Hattori can exploit. Proper usage of ninjas for scouting and watching for incoming enemy armies can allow the Hattori to succeed by quickly moving their armies to where they are needed, when they are needed. A short hop from the Hattori are the Ikoiki, a faction with a unique religion and unit roster. They have access to the unique Lone Sword Ashigaru, perhaps the best early game unit as they counter Yari Ashigaru, which most factions will be using, and even Yari Samurai and their low upkeep costs make them a prime garrison unit, which the Ikoiki will need to combat unrest. The Ikoiki have access to the typical Ashigaru units as well, though these variants have larger unit sizes and improved morale at the cost of poorer stats. Instead of Samurai, they have access to Ronin units, which are smaller than their Samurai counterparts but with better stats. Their unique religious buildings double as conversion centers and defensive buildings, as these will spawn a powerful garrison unit of Ikoiki Naginata warrior monks if a settlement is attacked. The Ikoiki also have access to improved warrior monk units, as well as their own unique matchlock warrior monks, though these are made rather inaccessible due to their cost. By far the greatest weapon the Ikoiki possess are their unique rebellion mechanic. Their Iko monk agents do not spawn the typical religious rebels, but rather Ikoiki rebels who will transfer control of the province and themselves if they succeed in conquering it. This means they can weaken and eliminate other factions and expand at their own expense without even declaring war, all while expanding their military rather quickly. Similar to the Hattori, however, their starting position and early expansion opportunities leave them prone to multi-front wars, and the penalty to diplomatic relations brought by their religion does not help. Even more damaging is their inability to recruit Metsukes greatly limiting their ability to raise taxes and in turn making it more difficult for them to fund the armies necessary for their defense. Thus, despite the wealth of their starting provinces and the wealth of provinces in central Japan, the Ikoiki have the worst economy of all factions, though they do start with the crafts resource which makes early trade opportunities possible. Moving over to the west of Japan, we have the Otomo clan who can recruit superior gunpowder infantry. They also have immediate access to imported matchlock Ashigaru, ensuring their castles are strongly defended from the outset. Small, weak Ashigaru armies in the early game should never be able to take an Otomo province. While the Otomo's Christian religion can make it harder to secure newly conquered areas, the missionary agent can be used to great effect in eliminating and weakening rivals, in a similar fashion to the Ikoiki. Unlike the Ikoiki, the Otomo can quickly secure their position by taking advantage of the fact that they are one of the only factions to start out with a ship, which can be used to block the crossing into Buzen, in turn allowing them to commit all their troops to the conquest of Kyushu. That this ship is a matchlock Kobaya should leave the Otomo uncontested at sea for several turns, by which time it won't be long before they have access to their most powerful naval weapon. With easy access to the trade nodes and the non-bond trade ship, the Otomo's economy will boom and facilitate their future conquests, which can be done rather bloodlessly through usage of missionaries. The presence of war horses in Higo will further bolster their economy, by allowing the Otomo to secure trade agreements in order to sell their large quantities of trade goods at full price. Building a non-bond culture will also give them access to Portuguese tercios, great units at range and strong in melee. Though the need for a non ban quarter, nominally limited to one per faction, will limit their usage. Kyushu's crafts resources and smithing can turn the already strong Otomo military into arguably the most powerful in the game. With all these advantages, the hard rating given by the game is laughable. Sharing Kyushu with the Otomo is the Shimazu clan. Perched on the corner of the map like the Date, one would think the Shimazu's early expansion would be straightforward. In reality, it is rather tricky. Expanding eastwards can leave the capital Satsuma vulnerable to attacks from the north, especially considering the Shoni and Otomo clans of northern Kyushu are quite aggressive. Complicating matters further is the religious situation. 
The Otomo provinces are largely Christian and oftentimes the Shoni will adopt the religion as well, presenting the Shimazu with a dilemma. They can either quickly expand to stem the spread of the religion or adopt it themselves. Being the only Buddhist faction with access to the Nanban trade port from turn 1, the latter option seems appealing, especially considering the usefulness of the Nanban trade ship in securing trade nodes and the missionaries' effectiveness in weakening clans on the mainland. Militarily, the Shimazu have immediate access to their superior katana samurai, who also benefit from Satsuma's smithing building. However, like the Date's capital, Satsuma can become an impractical training center as the clan expands eastwards, though this can be mitigated by transporting armies by sea. In the long run, the Shimazu should look to expand to Bizen, which would provide them with a frontline training center in the later parts of the campaign. The clan also has access to the powerful Shimazu heavy gunners, though these require gunpowder mastery, leaving them inaccessible unless the player commits to rushing the necessary research. The clan's economic prospects are almost identical to the Otomos, thanks to the Kyushu's rich provinces and nearby trade nodes, though they may lack the naval firepower to rule the sea if they do not convert to Christianity. Situated in Aki of Western Honshu is the Mori clan, a seafaring clan that like the Otomo starts out with a ship with the ability to immediately recruit more from their home province. Unlike the Otomo, their starting position is far more precarious, as Aki has three approaches from which it can be attacked, and while the Uchi to the west are initially allied, this often does not last long. It is imperative for the Mori to eliminate the northern Amako clan before turning to preemptively deal with the Uchi. Once this is done, the Mori's position is far more secure, as they can use their navy to control the straits between Honshu and Kyushu, leaving them with the choice of expanding into Kyushu, moving eastwards, or taking Shikoku to the south. While they start out rather vulnerable, their economic potential is strong. They can grab the trade nodes, conquer Iwami to the north, which has a gold mine, and Suwo to the west has war horses, giving the Mori the chance to rake in large amounts of trade income. On land, the clan has a few important advantages. Aki has a holy site that can be used to train units with superior morale, Bizen is a few provinces away and has a smithing specialty, and with DLC, the clan has access to Mori Wako Raiders, a sword unit that trades the armor of Katana Samurai for better stealth and the ability to deploy anywhere on the field, aside from the enemy's deployment zone. In another seemingly dangerous situation is the Oda clan of central Japan. With these distinction of being the only clan to start at war with two other factions, or three if you count Imagawa and Tokugawa separately, as well as being in the midst of a civil war. There are also a total of four approaches from which the capital of Awari can be attacked. The Oda situation is far more secure than it appears to be. For one, the Saito are not very aggressive, allowing the Oda to quickly wipe out the rebels and focus most of their resources on the Tokugawa to the south. The Tokugawa have a strong tendency to leave their only province undefended as they send their army to beeline towards Owari, allowing the Oda army to march into Mikawa and take it unopposed, causing the Tokugawa army to disband without a fight. While more units are recruited in Owari for an attack on the Saito, the main Oda army can expand freely into Imagawa lands as their flank is fully protected by mountains. The provinces are also quite lucrative, in addition to being easy to defend, they all have ports and Mikawa has the warhorse specialty, giving the Oda strong trading opportunities on both land and sea. And Suruga has a philosophical tradition, offering research boosts and more experienced Metsukes. Mikawa also starts out with a market, meaning the Oda can obtain one and recruit a Metsuke without the necessary research giving an important economic buff as well as an agent that can be used for scouting until ninjas are available. Owari itself is quite rich, and once the Tokugawa are defeated, it is very defensible, as the only entry points from the north and west are over bridges, forcing attackers into deadly choke points. This is especially useful against both the Hattori and the Ikoiki, who will generally attack the Oda if they are not defeated by other clans in the opening phase. The dynamics of this region leaves the Oda with multiple expansion options. They can push eastwards while holding the line at Owari, 
expand to the north to eliminate the Ikoiki and make use of Kaga's blacksmith, or push westwards into the rich regions of central Japan, which will also offer them access to better ninjas, metsukes, and monks. Facilitating this expansion is the Oda's faction bonus, which is among the best in the game. Their Ashigaru are cheaper and better, they have access to Oda Longyari Ashigaru, arguably the best infantry unit in the game, and Oda Matchlock Ashigaru are a powerful addition to their army if they are willing to rush the necessary research. Experience from battles and province upgrades will ensure these units remain the core of Oda armies even against late game samurai hordes. The reliance on cheap troops allows the clan's economy to thrive, even despite their distance from the trade nodes. If you were to choose the Tokugawa instead, you will be playing a faction with many of the same opportunities available to the Oda, if the clan was independent. The Tokugawa are vassals of the Imagawa, and while many players will rush to break away from their relationship as soon as the Oda are dealt with, this dynamic is actually a double-edged sword, and the Tokugawa's success will come down to making the most of their vassal status. Remember, while being a vassal leaves you without the freedom to declare wars as you see fit and forces you to surrender half your income per turn, declaring war against the Imagawa brings a hefty diplomatic penalty, reduces your daimyo's honor, and the Imagawa are often allied to the Takeda and or Hajo, two of the most powerful factions in the game. The moderately increased income may not be worth the public order penalties and political isolation. With the Tokugawa, you will need to rely on other factions to attack you or your master, and use this opportunity to expand your holdings, all while benefiting from the diplomatic security the Imagawa will provide. Once you feel you are powerful enough, it is best to entice the Imagawa into attacking you, usually through hostile agent actions, in order to break free without suffering the malices from rebellion. Since they will be the attacker, they are less likely to be joined by whatever allies they have at that point. Alternatively, you could simply choose not to actively get involved in a war that the Imagawa are losing, with the hopes of being set free as soon as they are wiped from the map. Militarily, the Tokugawa are supposed to have superior Kisho ninjas, though due to an oversight they are in fact worse than the regular variant. Aside from that, they can field Tokugawa mounted gunners, powerful skirmishers that are unfortunately too far down the tech tree for them to be of any use in the tricky early game. Despite being a vassal, the Tokugawa's economic situation is not too bad, as they start out with a market and recruit a Metsuke immediately. Close friends of the Imagawa are the Hajo clan, starting the game with two very good provinces. Aizu has a gold mine and Sagami has a blacksmith. And with the Hajo's bonuses to upgrading castles, these two provinces can be more easily exploited. However, early expansion is rather tricky, as each option presents a significant disadvantage. The Imagawa hold Suruga's philosophical tradition, but they are a large faction and typically ally the Takeda. The Hajo start at war with the weak Ogigeyatsu clan to the east, but expanding into that region of the map will leave them vulnerable on a wide front. One solution is to ally the Takeda, which will deter them from attacking, and their strength can be relied on as the Hajo work to secure the wide plains to their east. Alternatively, the Hajo can take Musashi and immediately attack the Takeda. Speed is of the essence here as the Takeda need to be eliminated before the Imagawa can come to their aid. This route will give the Hajo the war horses in Kai, and without it their economy will struggle as aside from Aizu, the surrounding provinces are unremarkable economically. Combining the trade opportunities offered by war horses with upgraded Metsukes from Suruga and Aizu's gold mine will leave the Hajo as one of the stronger economic powers, though outside of Sagami's blacksmith, their military is unremarkable. Their improved siege weapons are still largely inaccurate and unwieldy, slowing their armies on the campaign map, though the presence of mangonels or European cannons will offer a significant advantage in forcing AI armies to close the distance on the field, giving the Hajo the ability to dictate the course of battle. In the late game, they will gain access to an improved version of the already deadly fire rockets unit, as well as their own specialist Hajo hand mortars, effectively firebomb throwers with much greater range Though the slowness and low damage of these projectiles make them largely inferior to Hajo fire rockets, the Hajo starting daimyo also boasts the night fighter trait, especially useful when fighting the combined forces of the Imagawa and Takeda, 
as their armies can be dismantled individually without them bringing their full numbers to bear. North of the Hojo are the Takeda, master horsemen who, understandably, begin the game with the War Horses specialty. They are one of the strongest military forces in the game, with immediate access to cavalry at a time when other factions mostly lack them, giving the Takeda an important tool with which to target enemy generals, quickly disrupt archer fire, and chase down routing units. Adding to this is Takeda Shingen, the best daimyo in the game as he is both young and whose bloodthirsty trait instills fear in nearby enemy units, devastating against early game armies made of low morale Ashigaru. Due to how valuable this trait is and how difficult it is to obtain, a Takeda strategy will often involve moving Shingen between different armies such that they can benefit from his ability exactly when it is needed. Despite these advantages, early expansion opportunities are rife with threats. Though the Takeda start at war with the Murakami to the north, taking their province of North Shinano is unwise as it will leave the clan open to attack from many fronts. Not to mention it will bring them in contact with the Uesugi, who will almost inevitably declare war. Expanding eastwards presents the same problem. The provinces are large and lacking strong points from which to defend, leaving the Takeda with a wide border that they will not have the soldiers to secure. Finally, to the south are the Hajo and Imagawa, friendly clans and often allying each other, but defeating them will leave the Takeda with secure, valuable provinces and a route through which they can push westwards. Thus, the Takeda should look to secure peace from the Murakami as soon as possible before rushing the Hajo while their army is a few turns away in Musashi, and while the Imagawa are preoccupied with the Oda. Once both factions are defeated, the Takeda can choose to expand eastwards all the way to Iwate, leaving them with only one front to cover when Realm Divide hits, or they can move towards central Japan to seize its wealth and access to superior ninjas at the cost of having to fight across two fronts in the endgame. Mortal Enemies of the Takeda The Uesugi clan is quite possibly the most difficult clan to play. Firstly, their bonuses are hard to take advantage of. While the increase to trade income is welcome, their superior warrior monks are simply locked behind too many technologies for them to be of any use in the early game, and even disregarding this, the Uesugi will find it difficult to even secure the funds needed to buy such units or the buildings that would unlock them. Their bonus to Buddhist monk agents is also underwhelming. Unless the Iko Iki become a major power, the majority of provinces will remain Buddhist, making it difficult to use the Insight Revolt mission successfully and most provinces will not to be need to be converted either. The clan's starting province is also quite large with multiple approaches from which it can be invaded, though these approaches are narrow and can be blocked by a defending army. The Uesugi are also the only major faction to begin with a vassal in the Yamanuchi to the south. They are a complete liability, however, as soon they will be attacked by other factions, forcing the Uesugi to choose between two difficult options. Being dragged into unwanted wars, or abandoning their vassal and suffering a penalty to the daimyo's honor. The latter is the safer option, as the region to the south of the Yusugi's capital is wide and difficult to defend in, and severing ties with their vassal will allow them to concentrate their forces against the Jimbo in the west. However, this direction of expansion is not without its obstacles. Annexing the Jimbo's castle will bring the Yusugi into direct contact with the Ikoiki, a powerful military force whose provinces will need to be converted before the Uesugi can look elsewhere. Should the Uesugi succeed, they will gain two rich provinces that will offer them both superior melee and ranged units, but their troubles will not be over, because the Takeda typically grow to dominance in eastern Japan and they will almost inevitably declare war on the Uesugi once the clans have made contact. Much of the early to mid game will see the clan gaining and losing provinces as they will have a long front to defend and not enough troops to cover it. While this back and forth ensues, the Yusugi should also put together an invasion force that will set sail and conquer Sado, which is directly north of their starting province. Capturing this island will eliminate the threat of the Hanma, and most importantly the gold mine will give the clan a sorely needed economic boost, all while being isolated from enemies. On the flip side, this state of constant warfare will leave the Uesugi with highly experienced generals, whose abilities will be invaluable in the later phases of the campaign. Trade is another venue that Uesugi can struggle with, 
despite their bonus to this form of income, with the nearest warhorse specialties being in Mikawa and the capital city of the powerful Takeda, the Uesugi will spend much of the early game struggling to secure trade agreements. Thank you so much for watching guys, if you enjoyed this content please be sure to like, comment and subscribe, and if you would like to watch my live Total War content be sure to check out my Twitch, and if you are extremely dedicated and would like to keep up to date on all of the latest updates, be sure to check out my Discord server. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.